I'm very pleased to have uh, my next guest with me. Uh, when I was doing, in, in my disobedient days, doing cross-country checkups, she was a very frequent guest on that. And she had one, well, she had several remarkable qualities, what am I saying? But there was one <laughs> particularly remarkable, is that uh, her background, uh, she has a political background. And yet, uh, despite having a uh, party experience, uh, she was one of the clearest and cleanest minds, and she didn't carry the, the, the partisan weight into her comments. So Janice McKinnon is here. I thank you for agreeing to do this, and it's good to see you again. It's great to see you again. Well, let's just be uh, on a low key only, first of all. Uh, you're out west, as we in Toronto like to say, and in Newfoundland, you <laughs> say you're really out west. What's it been like there in the last uh, the last year during all of this business? Is it any different than anywhere else? I wonder. Um, no, probably not. One thing that is different. We live in Alberta right now. One thing that's different in Alberta is we haven't had these uh, travel bans. They say, well, you know, non-essential travel you shouldn't do. But it's allowed people here, we live in Canmore, which is in the mountains, yeah. people from all across the province, people from all across on, uh, um, Canada, a lot of uh, Ontario, Quebec license plates come here. And um, we do a kind, we're, we're more open to that. Yes, uh, there's dangers with that, health dangers, because they could bring, bring the virus. But, you know, they need a break too, and our economy, our local businesses need that. So I, I think that's something very different here yeah. that I think um, is very good. And one of the things that's happening is you see in the service industry, lots of particularly young people from Toronto and Montreal often saying, I just couldn't take what's going on there. They may be solving the health problem, but the life in those cities. And so they get in their car and they're looking for jobs and opportunities. And, you know, as I say, I'm sure there are, are health risks, but you feel for them too. And so I think the openness here to that, we, we've never been close the borders, stay in your house, get out and see the beautiful province. That's yeah, that is very, very interesting. As a matter of fact, I just caught one of your phrases there. There, there is a difference. Uh, all provinces, you know, have certain issues and certain problems, no question about it. But COVID uh, came at the end. It was the last car in the freight train uh, of uh, economic mischiefs and worse in Alberta. You had the oil price uh, knocked down. You've had the attack on the industry itself. You've had the, the great departures of businesses and capital from from uh, Alberta. Unemployment. All those. All of our crowd from Newfoundland lost all their jobs out there. So, how much more? I'm speaking only now of Alberta, probably to some degree of Saskatchewan. How much more has it hit? Because even with the small openness that you described. Uh, COVID arriving at the time that it did in these two provinces. Yeah, it it, it hit pretty hard. And um, I think, too, in Alberta, what people don't realize is that the government is really bringing together two parties that have only been together for a short period of time. And so the, the COVID regulations here are much more contentious. There's a more libertarian streak that the government's yeah. had to deal with. And um, so I think it's been very, very difficult. Um, I think, I think to, to understand the region, you have to understand that what the people in the prairies particularly have always known, we don't have enough votes yeah. in Canada. Yeah. And so the policies, particularly under the Liberals, because they have their power usually in Quebec and Ontario, they're going to decide what they're going to do. And it probably is sometimes not going to be to our benefit. And so you've seen that with the uh, the hike, the massive hike in the carbon tax. And the other thing that, that's a problem here uh, is, well, they're going to decide what to do. But sometimes, again, particularly a liberal federal government is going to tell us how to run our house. And I think emerging issue there is that daycare issue. Well, we, you, you, we'll give you money for daycare. It'll be a partnership. But it's our rules. So maybe we can get into that later. Yeah, we will. But I think they, there's kind of, um, there's a, a point, a tipping point here right now. 
Um, oil and gas, it's actually coming back. Um, you know, I looked at the paper today, significant increase in investment. A secret that nobody has really talked about is Alberta has actually, the government has controlled its spending. I looked at the budget. So they're not going to come out of this in bad fiscal shape. Um, their, their deficit's probably going to be lower next year than anybody expected. So I think a tipping point with the rest of Canada is going to be how they handle the oil and gas industry going forward. Because if you want to reduce emissions, there's two ways you can handle oil and gas. You can phase them out, just make it so difficult that they yep. can't survive. And, and that's an easy answer. And, and that's the answer of environmental groups, by the way, all of them just phase it out. But the hit to the Canadian economy would be massive. It's a major contributor to jobs and, and money for the federal government. The other way to do it is to take the oil and gas industry and help it reduce emissions. They already have reduced their emissions significantly. So when there, there's one thing in the budget there that I'm going to watch pretty carefully. If you want to help the oil and gas industry reduce emissions, one of the ways to do it is carbon capture. You take the carbon yeah. uh, and, you, and you bury it in, in the earth. And the Americans do that, use that technology a lot. And the government has financed the technology through a tax credit. So there was great hope here in the federal budget that there would be you know, some major announcement to provide federal support for uh, carbon capture. All the federal budget said was that they would have a tax credit, which is good news, but they'll take 90 days to decide what it is. So. This will be a very big signal. Is it a token amount and so restricted that it doesn't really mean anything? Or is it a significant commitment to, we're gonna use the track of trying to reduce, help these industries reduce their emissions. Um, but yeah, the, the, the treatment of the oil and gas industry is a huge problem here. And um, the other thing that's a problem, particularly in Alberta, if you look at Premier Kenny and his challenges, there is, um, for the first time, the separatist party, the, the Western separatist yeah. party, has a credible leader, Jay Hill, who was a, a federal conservative from British yeah. Columbia, actually. And so if, if this alienation continues and the ability to govern Canada and win an election without uh, any of the prairie provinces voting for you, even the interior of British Columbia didn't vote for them, um, then we're, we're, we're on a difficult track That's and that alienation will, can, will That's continue. That's very interesting because you you want to, it's, it's an amazing thing, at least it is to me, you want to, very few people I've talked to in the last year, even from out west, uh, COVID came in, this is a point I want to make, COVID comes in, it is obviously a genuine, uh, a genuine challenge requiring uh, somewhat different measures than normal. But before COVID emerged, and we, we did have that federal election, this is not a partisan thing, had the federal election, as you pointed out, a whole slice of the country, and you mentioned the interior BC, basically wasn't there in terms of putting anyone uh, uh, in the federal zone. And I knew from my own contacts out, out West, that even before COVID, uh, there was a big problem brewing, and the the urge for separation and as you say a credible leader there that unless it was attended to it was going to deepen and now we've had COVID which slaps another hard blow on Alberta and to some degree again Saskatchewan and um, no one attends is what I wanted to say no one attends to the other problems that COVID blankets over and of those uh, we used to call it alienation I call it the disenchantment out west with the way the system is running right now you've alluded to it so has it proceeded in the sense underground to become even stronger while we're not distracted but while our attention is fully fixed on COVID? well i think part of part of the the, the mitigating factors a lot of federal money has come in to businesses whatever so that's that there's something there that the federal government has done that has benefited individuals and businesses um, but I think the underlying tensions are still there. Um, yeah. And they, they, the federal government kind of ignores it at, at its peril. 
because it, it sits there, it percolates. It's like, you know, something percolating or um, it's <laughs> like a volcano. At some point, uh, some issue could yep. cause it to erupt. And what they don't understand is that the premiers, particularly Kenny, but to, uh, to some extent, Premier Mo, are in a difficult spot. They, they talk about these premiers as um, encouraging. No, they, they have to represent those ideas and those concerns. Otherwise, they, uh, they will be, uh, people will go to the separatists. But they have to be careful because they can't encourage separation. So they're always walking this, this tightrope. Yes, we feel disenchanted. These are yeah. our concerns. We have to be, we can't just, you know, gloss over the things that the federal government is doing that's hurting our region. And they have to, then the other people say, well, if you only cooperated with the federal government, it would work. No, if you did that, then that other wing of people who sit yeah. on the fence about separation will go to the separatists. But you can't be too strong because the separatists will gain strength from that. So um, and I don't think the federal government um, understands that and gives enough support to those premiers. They don't give them enough to, to fight the fight. Like, it's, here's what the federal government did yeah. for us today. <laughs> it's hard to think of those things. No, I, I think you're, you're completely on. And I'm, I'm glad I said what I said at the beginning. Uh, you're, not, you're not a person that, that, that stretches party lines. And, and a, a clean reading of one of the fundamental tensions I remember Pierre Trudeau, uh, when he went to the U.S. Congress some 35 years ago, and he was talking about Quebec separatism, that he was not going to uh, preside uh, over the fractioning of, of the Confederation. I see now that in the case of Alberta, I'm going to continue this a little bit more. In the case of Alberta, you almost have a reverse mirror effect from Quebec. In Quebec, the separatists actually want to separate. They have a specific idea of sovereignty and independence. What I found out in your region of the country is that those who go that path only go there reluctantly. I remember stepping outside one day in Calgary and this gentleman came up to me to just pass on an anecdote. Uh, I forget what was the most recent bad news from the federal government, but he just said to me, you know, this is too much. I think it was the carbon tax. He said, you know, I don't want to leave this country, but you know, uh, you're, you're pushing me there. So, I don't know why it receives so little attention. I mean, people like yourself and the premiers and business leaders and citizens have been raising this flag for a long while, but somehow or other, do we, do we need a revision in the Confederation before uh, to kind of channel some of these negative energies or will there be a rearrangement that in incorporates the new understanding of some provinces uh, over the last 10, 15, even 50 years? I don't know. I, I, I think the other thing that people don't understand, this is quite different than Quebec. Quietly, a significant number of business leaders support the move to a different relationship with Canada because the, the, the economics, it, 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 it's the opposite of Quebec. Quebec would suffer economically if it left Canada. There's, if you look at it, uh, certainly Alberta and Saskatchewan, the economics probably would benefit the two regions. So I don't know that we, we will end up in a constitutional quagmire, but it, it's uh, something it, that is not getting the attention it deserves. I think you're right, it's gone on underground, but it hasn't gone away. I, I'm glad to bring it up. Before I go to the budget and childcare, just one, one quick question. I've been reading yesterday and the day before, it's all over the internet, uh, that China uh, now in terms of these I call them phantom things, but that's the inner hair there. In terms of carbon emissions, surpasses all the rest of the industrialized world, all of it. And I read also that in British Columbia, uh, which has the heaviest carbon tax, they've given up the rebate system. Uh, mm -hmm. That emissions have gone up 11%. Mm -hmm. How much longer can we play with this little game that uh, uh, the, the small dot Canada, with its ineffective and perhaps reverse effect carbon tax, being completely clouded, I picked my word deliberately, by, by the scale and magnitude, the enormity of China. Why are we doing this? <laughs> well, it's a global problem, right? And so you have to have a global solution. Now, maybe uh, the Biden administration will get in there and, and uh, 
fashion a global solution. But I, th I think that the Americans, particularly and the rest of us, have a problem because China is considered a developing nation yeah. in terms of the standards. I mean, tell American workers who've lost their jobs to to, to Chinese firms that it's um, it's a developing nation. I think the other thing is that we have locked ourselves into a very narrow mindset that if you want to deal with um, the environment, it's got to be a carbon tax. And so if you look at Joe Biden, who's got probably one of the most ambitious environmental plans Absolutely. in the world, there's no carbon tax there at all. He no, says, no, really? that's not going to happen. <laughs> and so it's not as if we have only one choice and that's the choice that we were on. And we never had the debate, like we could do this, we could do that. There are many yeah. ways to tackle it, but somehow or another, the government has persuaded Canadians that if you don't support a carbon tax, you don't want to deal with the environment. And I don't know what their answer is to how do you explain Joe Biden? Because he clearly wants to deal with the environment, but he has no carbon tax. Well, again, you mentioned Mr. Biden. I mean, he comes in on his first day. Yeah. He cancels Keystone XL and Mr. Trudeau and his bunch. And I, I don't care if this is partisan or not. It's like a pillow hitting a, a field of marshmallows in terms of the noise <laughs> yeah. coming out of them. Uh, now, to, as, as I'm talking to you, and this will be broadcast later, uh, tomorrow, uh, yeah. if Gretchen Whitmer has her way, and I don't, I don't think she will, but who knows? But suddenly, uh, a major source of oil, which comes originally from Cal uh, from Alberta, uh, co comes into Ontario and Quebec, and she's saying, "Oh, we got to shut down Line Five. I mean, no, I just, know. Can no, she do that? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I I doubt that she can. But you know, there should be a lesson here." Um, Today was a good day in Alberta. I, sadly, I say this because of a um, uh, cyber attack on a pipeline on the, e yep. the East Coast. How vulnerable we are. It, it, like the pipeline debate is so crazy because if you don't have a pipeline, people are not going to stop using oil. They're just going to take the oil to those people in a more environmentally dangerous way. They're going to put it in trucks yep. or trains yep. or whatever. But we don't realize how fragile this is, you know, that all of a sudden, you know, Saudi Arabia gets attacked. All of a sudden, we need yeah. this commodity and the price goes skyrocketing. We've been and very, so, yeah, very, we've got that, that. We've been very careless over a whole lot of things. So, again, I'd like to continue this because it, only for one reason, really, it doesn't get aired properly in very many locales. And if you're listening to any of the major networks here in Toronto or the newspapers in the main, uh, the one I work for actually is a bit of an exception on that, and that's a good thing. But the 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 fundamental issues that occupy other provinces or the fundamental challenges, like, like the fragility of, of the whole civilization, really, uh, in relation to its energy needs, hardly ever gets serious discussion. But anyway, I go back to your own experience. You were finance minister for some time. We've had the strangest year and a half or so here in Ottawa, uh, parliament in some sort of zombie state, and uh, every now and then, like this particular medium, I don't really like it zooming for its uh, its hearings. We we jumped from a promise of zero deficit in 2019 to something like 400 billion in the course of a year. Just as a as a person with experience at at a provincial level of managing an economy, this is a staggering change over a very short time. Yeah, it is. And um, I know people who were involved in the 90s, we kind of despair because we know where it's going. We know where it ends up. There's, um, there's this idea out there that as long as you can borrow money and the interest rate is less than growth in the economy, you can continue borrowing endlessly. You can just roll the, the money over. As the loans come due, you roll them over. And it's a popular theory. And one of the sad things that from her budget speech, the finance minister looks like she buys into that to some extent. Um, I, I guess the faith I have is the average Canadian, I don't know if you saw, there was an analyst poll that said the majority of Canadians were concerned about the size of the deficit. Um, my hope is that the average Canadian is practical enough to know that you can't do that. You, you can't do that on your credit cards. Yeah, if you got enough money, you can pay just the interest down and keep the principal there. But at some point, you know, yeah. one of those changes, interest rates go up 
or your economy goes down and then you're left with a structural deficit, a spending a lifestyle that you can't afford and massive debt. So it's, um, it's a strange time because of that. I think the other thing that's there that is promoting this is the view that if this is going to be paid for, you can tax business or tax wealthy Canadians. And I think what people don't realize, first of all, there'd be economic consequences from doing that, but there are not enough rich people in Canada and corporations cannot bear enough taxation anywhere close. You can't get enough money from that. And so what you're building to is an increase in taxes, like raising the GST at some point. But you're right, uh, we can get into some of the details of the budget if you want, but, but the, the mindset, uh, this is the first finance minister who I watched the whole thing. Not once did you get the sense that you have to with a finance minister. These are your tax dollars I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. I really spend them carefully, prudently, and I am aware that, you know, you cannot continue to borrow money like this. There was nothing there. And, and that's the message that's coming from their, the federal government to Canadians. Well, there's a couple of points to make there on, on the kind of immediate side. Uh, I said it was a staggering increase, and it is staggering. Yeah. But it's also accompanied, not accompanied by, absent uh, from the moment. Uh, are the account accountability mechanisms needed to supervise the outlay of such outrageous sums of money? The Auditor General early on complained that, it, that her office simply didn't have the personnel at this stage. If you're inflating uh, the expenditures exponentially, we need more. Uh, you know, financial officials all over. Uh, we had a closed parliament. We had a weakened opposition. Uh, we had an epidemic. Uh, that obviously put put uh, the, the, put the minds of most people on only one subject while this went on. And you mentioned two things. Imagine if the interest rates went up, and because the world is a, a precarious arrangement, you also had some crisis and economies go down. Uh, there are perils present in this that are really, really large. Yes, and they don't, whatever, the other thing is when they look at, you know, the, the deficit de debt number for Canada, they don't take into account the provinces. Yes. It, yeah, and so you look at Newfoundland, and you've written about Newfoundland, and I've been there talking to people about the finances. If that province gets into fiscal trouble, uh, it is in fiscal trouble, it but is. if it looks like it's going to default, the federal government is going to have, a, have to have a plan to bail it out with terms and conditions. So it's not just the federal debt, it's the provincial yes. debt. And I think the other thing is what you see in the budget, you see many things that are disturbing. The amount of spending, um, you know, economists were saying you don't need now, after all the spending during the pandemic, maybe start there, st spending during the pandemic needed because people lost their jobs, the economy could collapse, governments around the world spent huge amounts of money. In Canada, we were at the top end of the spending. We spent more than comparable countries. People, some people got more from the programs than they did from their previous salaries. And the programs were put together quickly. So there were problems, which is fair enough, but the problems have, haven't been addressed. Now no. the Globe and Mail is, is carrying stories about the wage subsidy that was for struggling companies has been used by companies who have lots of money. So it, it, there's no, there's that. And then if you look at the uh, budget itself and, and before the budget, you can see that there's no fiscal restraint. There's nobody saying, well, do we spend the money here or there? We have, choi we have to make choices because we have limited funds. Um, in the budget and before the budget, the government wanted to help low-income seniors. There's a program called Guaranteed Income Supplement. It's just for low-income seniors. Yeah, I know. They put the money into old age security, which goes to seniors with the incomes more than $100,000. Um, so it's just, it is like a spending spree. There's no, there's no boundary to it. And the, the sad part is if you look at the economy, the economist said, you don't need stimulus right now. You don't need to spend another hundred billion because all of the programs and all of the savings, because people haven't been able to spend money, there's going to be a 
spurt of growth here for a year or two. But what the problem that they don't address is after that, the economy is going to go back into slow growth, uh, aging population, and the most critical thing, business investment declining for five years in Canada. They, don't, they haven't addressed any of those underlying issues. And so they will recur with a greater debt and deficit load dragging yeah. along with them. So there's the problem. You're not looking to the future. You're still spending on programs for the present. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, you have more authority to speak on these things than I will ever claim. But even an amateur, a layperson looking on, uh, I, I really don't get over. It. I remember 2015 when uh, Mr. Trudeau in that election said and startled everybody that he was going to spend, you know, 10 billion uh, deficit a year. But by 2019, it would be, but the figure 10 billion <laughs> yeah, yeah. At, at the time, you know, <laughs> that oh, looks boy, lovely. This, <laughs> this is shocking. Now we're up to something like four fifty. Let me go to the subject that you wanted to deal with earlier on there. This business of uh, one of the most well written about proposals in the budget was this uh, child care. Just give me your, your, your thoughts and feelings on that. You've already hinted at some. Yeah. So the idea of if the federal government putting money into a child care program is a good idea because, you know, with the aging population, you need any, anybody that you can get into the workforce, into the workforce. So that allows both parents to work. Women have been hard hit during the recession. The child care benefits women more. So very strong case. Even businesses say a, a child care program is a good idea. The issue becomes the provinces have complete jurisdiction over child care. Only they can run the programs, set the rules, enforce the rules. So how does the federal government create some kind of national program when it's totally the jurisdiction of the provinces. They had two choices. There was a really good option from the 1990s. The, the liberal government of that time wanted to deal with child poverty. They paid um, a sum to low-income parents to give them more income and more benefits. So, you know, their kids had their eyeglasses covered, et cetera. So that parents could move from welfare to work, get people into the workforce. Wonderful program. The federal government did that. It was provincial jurisdiction. The provinces saved money on welfare. They had to spend the money on other social programs. Worked wonderfully. That would have been a great model. But what they did instead, and so if you wanted to really deal with childcare and you wanted to do it quickly and effectively without the controversy, they could have done the same. A grant, a tax regime where parents have a credit they can use for childcare paid by the federal government. And the federal government could increase spaces by giving subsidies to daycares and say to the provinces, you're gonna save some money here, so spend it on your old childcare. It could have been done seamlessly. It could have been done quickly. Instead, they went back to something almost like the old Medicare model. Uh, and this is going to cause huge problems, particularly in the prairies, because we don't like Ottawa saying, well, this is the plan. It's yeah. a partnership, but it's our rules. And so they say, well, it's going to be a national program. We'll put up half the costs, but you got to follow these rules. And just that idea here is going to be a problem. But the, 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 the criteria, some of them don't necessarily make sense. So what, why $10 a day daycare? Now parents pay over $1,000 a month for daycare. What if some provinces say, well, actually, I'd like to have more expensive daycare, $20 a day with 50, because I'd like to create more spaces. Or what if some provinces say, I don't think rich people should have cheap daycare. I'd like to actually gear it to income. The provinces need the flexibility to yeah. do that. It sounds like they're not going to get it. The other thing is what kind of daycare is covered. Um, it looks like they may be talking about just nonprofit daycare that exists and our kids went to them and yeah, they're great. But they don't serve many of the people in the workforce today. Mm -hmm. It's often small operators, you know, a couple of women who run a daycare for people on the shift work. What, do you, what if you work midnight to eight? Are you, those daycares aren't going to be available to you. Um, and so they have to be flexible in what 
kind of daycare is covered. Otherwise you'll get, they, they talk about the Quebec model, but 50,000 people are on the waiting list for that model and you know, for, the, for daycare in Quebec. And so you can get to a point that you have this elite of people who actually got the $10 a day daycare yeah. and other people who work shifts, part-time gig workers, they're scrambling still. And so it's a good idea, but again, it's executed in a way that I think could cause unnecessary controversy and tensions, particularly with some of the prairie provinces and delays, delays. This, okay. you, you won't get here easily. Let me go back to the, uh, the overall question again. I, I, I stressed that you were, were in government. Uh, the pandemic is exceptional. It's a kind of political singularity, if you will. So you certainly will want with people uh, in authority for not having it perfectly right. But as we now have a year and some several months experience with this, the vacillations, the variations in advice, no mask, mask are no good, you got to have a mask. The vaccine rollouts, which have been pathetic uh, because the procurement of it was botched in the beginning. Today, you're hearing <clears throat> that one of those vaccines, uh, the gap between the, it and the second is far too long. I know it was difficult and I know it was unique and it is genuinely a crisis. But as a person who was in government and you can spread this book to provinces and federally, what's your mark for the way that this has been managed or mismanaged yeah it hasn't been managed well for sure um the I, th I think the federal government's handling of the border has been a huge problem the, the vaccines for sure and not kind of fessing up and saying we didn't procure them properly was a problem in the border the, the borders were i don't know if you remember but trump close the border yeah. to to Europeans and people in Canada were laughing and they were know, laughing and calling him racist as as always the response is yes and and the and our um the uh, health uh, officials in Ottawa were saying this is not going to work it's not a good idea i think the border has been a huge problem contributing the cases as far as the provincial premiers i i feel very sorry for them oh my gosh you know, I felt like writing a letter to them saying, you know, I was in government during the fiscal crisis. Yeah. This is worse. It's harder. And at least we had arithmetic. We had answers. The arithmetic told us that where we were. And if we could only explain the arithmetic to people, we could get to, to the solution. These premiers, they're not, there's no precedent here. They can't say, well, you know, this happened before, um, they are pressured from all sides. You know, the health people would close down everything. Some of the business people would keep everything open. The opiate crisis, the increase in domestic violence, they're dealing with it all at the same time. And they have no experience, no guidelines here. And yeah, they're flailing about, I agree. Um, but I, I feel for them. I just, I can't <laughs> imagine how hard it would be. Well, your kind lady is always uh, I know I could stretch just another 30 minutes, but uh, again, I have some respect for your life, and so I'm not going to do it to you. Janice, I thank you very much uh, for giving me this window on your time. I think, by the way, the observations both on the budget and on certain political forces in the West are very necessary things to hear. So thank you very much. Oh, wonderful to talk to you. Yes, absolutely a treat to talk to you. No, it's a treat to you. You're my favorite from Chekhov, I'll tell you that for sure. And I'm not joking. <laughs> if, 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 there, if it ever lifts and you get here or I get out there and you're in range, uh, we'll find some ridiculously expensive place and have a meal. Yes, for sure. We will do that. Thank okay. you again. You're a good yeah, person. Take care.